let's try uh, this. Now, here's a um, something that I, I thought about, and, and Barry was there standing with me impatiently because um, I was taking all this time trying to photograph the road. Rather than say, look, I'm going to shoot at a lot low ISO and like 400, and at night this is an ISO 400, the kind of stars you get, uh, and then here's Albany on the horizon, right? Uh, still a 25 second shot at f2.8, I'm at 15 instead of 14 millimeters for some reason. So I had two choices here. One was I could have said I'm going to shoot at this light level and instead of 25 seconds I'm going to need to shoot for three minutes to get the exposure where I need it to be. Or I just say well I'm going to stick with 25 seconds but I'm going to shoot at this light level and, and and use that to try to build something from. So I wanted the low ISO because what I want to do with this is I want to make it a lot of detail. And if I shoot at 3200, that detail is going to include a ton of noise. So I wanted to shoot at the low ISO. So that's step, that's step one. So then if I look at this one, so right here, let's zoom in a little bit here. So you can see there's a fair amount of noise in the image. So let's talk a little bit about processing for the Milky Way, and I know that's something that several of you are, are, are very interested in. Um, <clears throat> so these are kind of defaults. Let me see, make sure. Yep. Um, on Lightroom, I don't know. This is where mine defaults to. I'm assuming everyone defaults about the same. It seems to me like I remember that sharpening used to be at around 25, but now it's yeah. at 40. So I, I don't know why or what, maybe it's a new version or something like that, but typically it's, it's a little lower. And let me, yeah, okay, so I'm resetting this. Let me just make sure everything's reset. All right, so everything is now defaulted, and so this is the noise that's in that image coming straight out of camera. And I'm gonna find an area like here, because we've got some color in this as well. So, you have two different types of noise that you get in an image. One has to do with light, and the other has to do with color. And what you want to do is eliminate a little of both. And we talked a little bit about, you know, that's a pretty sharp image. Uh, I'll tell you what do, I'm going to drop this down. And this won't help much, but clear out some of it. So, <clears throat> the stars and everything are pretty sharp. That's fine, but if you tried to blow this up, you would see all that noise. So you try to find an area like this, and we want to take luminance, and we can take that up a little bit, and you can see it just softened up a hair. You probably could go up to around 25, 26, even 30 at the upper end with just light uh, <coughs> removal. And it's still pretty grainy there. And then you can take the color detail, and that can go a little higher, uh, maybe up around 45 or 50. And when you do that, you can already see, look how soft this kind of looks. So you have to kind of decide how much softness do I want. And I, if you're familiar with Lightroom at all, these little toggle switches up here, you can toggle them on and off to get a feel for what the impact is on the image overall and decide whether you like that or, or don't like it, okay? And sometimes the, the the change can be very dramatic and other times not so much. Now, there's still a fair amount of noise in there, but I think if you're printing this at a standard print size, you're not blowing it up huge on some kind of canvas, it'll be fine. If you are going to print it very large, one thing to keep in mind is that large prints are normally viewed from further away. And once you get beyond about seven or eight feet, the human eye loses the ability to distinguish between small dots. And so the noise would, would disappear anyway uh, because they're the smallest items, or the smallest dots on that image are those uh, uh, grains of, of noise. So I've got this image and I always, I guess, have that option of saying, well, if I wanted to just bring up the shadows, 
would that be enough for that road to make it look the way I want it to? The problem is I'm not going to have, I mean, you can see the noise that's in there. And if I try to brighten this any more, it really adds to the noise, really makes it bad. So we're going to take the shadows back, back down. Oh, and I've got, it looks like I've got a hot pixel there. Yeah, see that right there. Any of you guys seen those before, hot pixels? You know what they are? So you just get a spot on your sensor, and I don't think it's always in the same spot either because uh, I've seen them pop up in different places. But you have this, it's like that pixel's decided it's going to show bright red. That's what it's going to do. So you, you have to look through your images to try to try to get rid of those. All right, so now let's go back over to the, the other road image here. So what I'm wanting to do is kind of blend this with this guy. And the way to do that, and I'm going to do it real simple for us, uh, so you're going to take, highlight both of them, right click, edit in, and you're going to want to open as layers in Photoshop. Open what? Open as layers. And again, I'm recording this, so it should, I should be able to kind of even play this back later. If you... Okay, but you, you just went to Photoshop. Okay. I just switched to Photoshop. So if you right click on this, and edit in and edit in Adobe Photoshop, what it does is open each image as individual files in Photoshop. And what you're wanting to do, how many of you have used Photoshop and used layers? Yep, no? Okay, so <clears throat> I'm gonna, I'll, I'll show how this is gonna work. So if you go into Photoshop through that top line, you're gonna have two different files open in Photoshop. Okay, and so you still haven't accomplished trying to get them into one spot so you can blend them. So instead you open them, as, open them as layers. Now, you can have, well, I did a time lapse. I had 400 images as layers in Photoshop. And so we're going to go back to Photoshop and I'll show you what this looks like. So right now you see this image. This is what you're seeing. If I turn it off, now you're seeing the image that's behind it, okay? So what you want to do is figure out a way to say, well, I don't want to see this. I just want to see this coupled with this that's behind it, right? So what you're going to do is, oh, where's my, uh, i got to shrink my window here. And again, this is being recorded, and I'm going to also do another video on it. So just stick with me, and then you'll get a chance later. So right down here, you have this button right here creates a mask. So what it's just done right here is created this thing, and this is white, right? Which means that you're not seeing uh, anything here that's going on behind it. So what we want to do is make part of this mask transparent so that we can see this area behind it. Okay? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So the way we do that is we take a brush, B on the keyboard, and we now have a brush. Here's our brush, this round dot right here. If we look down here, we can see we've got a black square and a white square, and the black square is on top, which means we're going to be painting black. If we paint black onto this white area, we're essentially making it transparent so that we can see through to what's behind. So if I take this and I'm gonna I'm gonna make it a little larger. Uh, I'm gonna come back to this, but notice up here, opacity at 100% and flow at 100%, which means that whenever I paint on there, it completely clears it out. And the flow means it's 100%. There is no slightly painting or anything. You've got a brush full of paint, and you're just slopping it on there. And so if we just paint that across there, this is what we've done. We've now, and you can see over here, there's a line across there. We are now looking through this top layer to the bottom layer. Okay? So you could go real easy with it. And we'll just take this real big. 
and just paint like this. Now, we get down close to the horizon and we have to start paying a little more attention. The brush size is, and hardness is over here. So we've got a 2300 pixel. I don't pay that much attention to that. that. I just know how big I want the brush to be visually, right? Yeah. Whether it's 2300 pixels or 400 or whatever, it doesn't really matter to me. By the way, I'm changing the size using the bracket keys on the keyboard is how that, is how that works. The hardness is important uh, because that tells you, right now I'm at 79%. If I'm at 100%, that edge, see how it kind of bites? It's almost like a bite out of a cookie or something else, right? It's extremely sharp. <coughs> if, on the other hand, you go to a hardness of zero, then it becomes so soft that getting you might not be able to get exactly the look that you're wanting for, or it might be exactly what you're looking for. <clears throat> so in this case, I just set it to that, and now we've essentially kind of got the image that we're looking for. We've got our foreground here, it's in focus, it's lit well, and we've got our background, and it's where we want it to be. But we've still got two layers. We don't have one image yet that we're working with, we have two layers. and so. Uh, I, I'll make, make a note up here. This TK stands for Tony Kuiper, K-U-Y-P-E-R. <coughs> He's created these action panels, and there's a thing called luminosity masking. I'll touch on that. But uh, he just created all these shortcuts. So you can flatten the image through multiple ways. I just use this. When you flatten the image, essentially Photoshop says, okay, you've made all your changes. Let's blend these images together. And now we have one image that is our background. If we save this, file save, <clears throat> you can see it's saving down here. When it finishes up, this is why I need a new computer. Just FYI, so this image that we just saved is 250 megabytes in size. So, and that's flattened. If you save it as what they call a PSD file, which means that you don't flatten the image, you maintain all of the data separate for each layer, and I highly recommend you do that if you're doing really complex image edits, because if you find something later that you want to correct and you flattened it, you've kind of got to start over. <coughs> so if you're doing multiple layers with multiple blending modes and all of that, I, I recommend you save one copy as a PSD and then you can flatten it if you want and, and make, make more edits. And feel free to chime in. She's far more expert at this than I am. She, she could doze off over there. No. <laughs> okay, so now we've saved that. If we go back into Lightroom, we're gonna find that that image is sitting here blended and you can see it's called edit.tif, TIFF file. When you go to do prints, by the way, sometimes your printer may ask you for a TIFF file versus a JPEG, and you're going to get a TIFF file from shooting in RAW and then making an edit and saving as a TIFF. <coughs> it's a whole other class, but in Photoshop, you have lots of options of how you want to save that file when you save it. Um, okay, so now we've got our single image, and this is something that you couldn't get just in camera, right? Well, you could, but you would have a lot of grain in this, and so you couldn't really edit this area the way you wanted to. Okay, so we've got our, our sky here, we've got our foreground. To me, the foreground's a little bright. So now I'm getting into personal preferences around what do I want the image to look like, right? So how can I make this a little, a little lighter? So here's where I think Lightroom is just phenomenal in that it has so many of the tools that Photoshop does. So, who's familiar with the graduated neutral density filter? Yep. So you can just replicate that. This little square right up here basically creates one. And you have all these sliders available to you to control uh, what something's gonna look like. Now, you could go in here and make changes and then draw on the image. <clears throat> I tend to go a different direction. So here's, this little area down here, Show Selected Mask Overlay. And you can click on this. <clears throat> and then when you draw on here, and I'm going to start right here, and I'm going to push up. 
and we're going to push up to about there. Sometimes it's hard to get that straight. But now I've got this red that's showing me the area that's going to be impacted. Now, the wider you make this, the more gradual this transition is. If you have it very narrow, then the transition is very abrupt. So typically you're going to want some kind of, of transition going on so it's gradual. Everything from this line to this edge is going to be 100% impacted by any changes that you make up here. So now that I've got this kind of laid and I've got the area that I want to impact uh, highlighted, I, I turn this off. I, I have to admit that there's been times when I forgot to turn it off and I'm painting on my deal and it's red. And I'm like, why is it red? What's going on here? It's kind of like Barry with his red headlights. We can't, you know. So uh, turn that off. Oh, one thing, FYI, I think, uh, let's see here. If you hold down the shift key and hit O, it changes the way that overlay looks. So if you don't like the red, you can go to something different. Um, <clears throat> and then if you hit the O button, it turns that mask overlay on and off. And you can see I'm getting already uh, some kind of changes going on with that. So it's on, let's turn it off. And so now we can decide, our, what do we want to do with it? Well, I said it was a little overexposed. Now, um, as I mentioned earlier, I like clarity. As I said, I'll, I'll make something, add a lot of clarity, take it into Photoshop, bring it back into Lightroom just to add more clarity. <coughs> it's like cowbell, more cowbell, more clarity. Same kind of thing. For any Saturday Night Live fans, you'll know what I'm talking about. So here's the thing, if you add clarity, a lot of times you, you get the crunch, and because this is dark, it's not as much, but you'll find two things about adding clarity, and this really is related to my style and the way I process images. You may want to do it completely different. Um, two things about adding clarity. Usually it adds brightness because it's adding some bright to the midtones. The other thing that it does is it, it actually takes down vibrance. Um, and it's not real visible here. I can show it to you on another image. But so this didn't even, by adding the clarity though, it didn't tone it down enough for me. Uh, I would actually take this down just a little bit further. And now we're getting closer to what I had in mind, which is enough to create some interest with the yellow line and stuff and still create these leading lines into the distance but not so bright that it pulls away from the fact that there's a Milky Way there, right? Um, we can add some vibrance with this, um, or, sharp, or excuse me, saturation right here. Um, I'm not liking how yellow it is, right? We've got the yellow in there. So I would offset that with a little bit of my white balance and toning it down a little bit. So now I've eliminated some of the yellow in there uh, but that yellow stripe is still there, but the road is looking a little darker. All right. So now that I've done that, I go, yeah, but I really want this, this stripe to be yellow. So here's one of the tricks I like in Lightroom. So this HSL and this color panel, Hue, Saturation, Luminance. Um, if you click on Saturation, well, I was already on Saturation, so when I did that, what it did is brought up all three panels, and I don't want that. I just want Saturation Panel. This little deal right here, if you click on that and then go to wherever you want in the image that you're wanting to accentuate a color and take, and you can just click on it and drag up. Now, you can see what it did. So you can control the sliders individually if you want, or you can drag it up. Now, I don't like that because look, it made it turn green. So it's one of those deals where in the, uh, in the processing, you're like sometimes unexpected results. And honestly, that happens more often it, with nighttime than it does in the day because the lights are different. Yes? I just wanted to do a quick time check. What would you be doing to that sky? It's 9.50 almost. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the sky. <coughs> Let me uh, get rid of this. So we're going to just focus on the sky for now. <coughs> don't want to worry too much about here. I think you saw how I blend the image. Uh, so there's not much really that we need to talk about more there about it in terms of the blending. But so the night sky, <coughs> uh, 
you can kind of start from the top and work your way down with these basics. Um, what is the white balance here? It's saying as shot. Oh, because I'm over in a TIFF file. So let me go back to this file here. Uh, shot 3950. Yeah, so I'm back at my original capture because here it's going to show me exactly what temperature I shot it as. So daylight is 5500 white balance. That's 5500 Kelvin is, is typical white balance, right? Uh, if you shoot in a studio with a flash, it's 5500 daylight is, is what they call it. And I've heard people say before, well, starlight, star is a bunch of stars, right? It's daylight, shoot at 5500. I usually find that to be pretty warm. Um, so at 5500, it's getting closer to black. Now, there is a methodology that some people use to determine what's the best white balance uh, for the deal. And they literally take, and they take their vibrance and their saturation all the way up. And then they start playing around with this and they go, oh, I got too much green. Whoops, now I got too much magenta. And the idea is to try to get to a kind of an even black tone uh, in there. And then once you've kind of got that where it is, then you take and you bring these back down to where they're at. And you can see that's fairly black, black and white, right? And that's a, a starting point for you. Um, really, the night sky, when you get done with your processing, is really a personal preference. Some people like it dramatically colored. Other people prefer it to be more natural looking. Uh, and it really could depend upon the image that you're doing. Okay, so the white balance piece, the, the steps I just showed you to take the vibrance up, shift around the, the, the purple, magenta, everything else, you can see really right here, the, it's 3950, so it's about where I shot it at. I added a little bit of magenta in the end to get back to kind of where I thought it was, it was right. So that's the white balance piece. So then exposure, not really going to mess with that too much. Uh, contrast, I kind of like. Um, I like seeing the, the darks versus the lights in the Milky Way, so I add a little bit of contrast. Some people in this area here will use whites, other people use highlights. Uh, for me, it's really a matter of kind of which one is going to... So, watch the difference here. So, with highlights, bringing them up, really all that's brightening mostly is this area right here. In another image that I've worked with, when there's less on the horizon, highlights work great for bringing out the brightness in the stars. Okay? So, we'll leave that alone. If we do white, it is brightening the horizon, but it is bringing more of the brightness out in these areas right up here. And then you can take the blacks down. So you can do contrast one, either, either of those ways. Now, one thing I'll show you take this back here, take this back here. So there is some masking. Most people think of masking in terms of Photoshop. You can actually do it inside Lightroom as well. So um, are you familiar, are you guys familiar with these little deals up top here? Anyone not familiar with them? You're familiar with them? You know what they do? No. So what these do is show you when you've gotten out of bounds. So this one over here shows you shadow clipping, which means that, see these little blue spots right here? That means that area is completely black. There's zero information there. It's just plain black, nothing else to it, right? Notice that this one would show red if it was blown out white. There is no blown out whites here. So ultimately, if you look at an image and you think about, I want to get the full capability of my camera, what you want to do is have whites exposed to the point that they're just starting to blow out and blacks underexposed to the point to where they're just starting to turn into blue on the screen, right? So you can go to your whites deal here and if you hold down the alt key, <clears throat> so I've got one spot there that's white and as I start bringing this over, so all of these little whites that are showing up, 
are spots where it's just white. There's no color, there's no data, there's nothing. And so because those are all stars, I don't care that they're just white. I kind of, you know, that's all, I'm okay with that. Now, look how bright that is, okay? That means that everything but those stars, <clears throat> everything but those dots that you see right there, despite how bright it looks here, there's still data there. There's still color, there's, there's something other than pure white. Now, do you need to go that far? I don't know. See that one right there? That's Mars, okay? So then if you go the other direction, hold down the Alt key and get blacks. We already knew there was one, so now you slide the black slider over. All of those areas there that are black, black, are there's nothing but black there. The yellow, it's getting there. The red's getting there, etc. So by doing that, what I've done essentially, and I'll turn these off so we get rid of the reds and the whites. What I've done right there is said that in this image, I have now captured as much information as I can. From the far left to the far right, you couldn't really get any more information in there. It's all there. Now it's a matter of what you're going to do with it. So then you look at the image and you go, wow, okay. It, you know, Honestly, if we were somewhere else, this wouldn't be so blown out. This is pretty nice. I like this Milky Way sky. But it's too much, so we're going to have to bring the whites back down. So, okay, we're going to go with that. So plus 43. But I kind of liked it at plus 75. So what can I do? Well, let's take this graduated neutral density filter. Let's take the whites, bump them up a little bit. And let's just drag across here. And we're going to pull this down. And we'll just play with that area and try to bring up some of that whites that we're not getting because we didn't want to impact this part of our image. Does that make sense on how we did that? Kind of how we got there in terms of figuring out where the max was? Okay. <clears throat> so we'll lose that. This is obviously too dark. So our choices are really are just kind of bring the blacks. We can bring them back up. Um, oh, wait a minute. Am I on the wrong? Yeah, I'm on the wrong image. Yeah, there we go. So <clears throat> the, the processing of this, because this is the exact same image, I mean, that is this. So it would be the same way. You take the whites up until this has gotten too bright, and then you'd add a filter there. We'll just leave this kind of set where it was at. Bring that down. So we're just trying to add a little more a little more brightness to the sky. <coughs> so, clarity. We've talked a little bit about clarity. You can see what it does here. I mean, it deepens the, the darks. It does um, create to me a little bit more contrast that helps with making the Milky Way pop. The dehaze filter is something they've added uh, recently. It tends to darken images quite a bit. It also creates some pretty dramatic color shifts, and so you really want to go pretty easy with that. Um, vibrance, we could add a little bit if we want, but it's already so yellow that uh, I'm not sure I would go that direction. This road is driving me absolutely nuts being that color. So I'm gonna let's see what happens if we go here. Right. Saturation way down. Clarity way down. We're going to take it back to kind of maybe where it was at. Uh, still not liking it. Alright. <clears throat> so, if. Um, Take this, let's see, Where did my key go here. So, before and after, pretty big difference. Now, you may not like this image. You may say, you know what, I like that better. It's more of a personal preference. <clears throat> hmm? No. <laughs> 
I go to, to, to tone down the, the bright sky there? The, yep. The yellow? Yep. So let's just, we're going to use, I'm going to do it two ways, but I'm going to start with a brush. And I always, whenever I click on one of these tools, I try to double click on effect because it zeroes everything out. You can go in and click on them individually, but if you just double click on effect, it zeroes everything out. Now, these settings up here, uh, you can create tons of presets. And I have some, she's like nodding her head. So for a brush, so you can create a brush that you use specifically for painting the Milky Way sky with, that has all the settings that you like. And you just save it as my Milky Way brush. And then anytime you're processing a Milky Way image, you click on custom, drop down to, uh, it'll be listed there, Milky Way brush. Click on it, and now all the settings are the ones that you've always used for, for adjusting the Milky Way, and then just paint on the Milky Way. And it just, it'll do it at one time. You don't have to manually go in each time and recreate it. There's a lot of <coughs> things out there right now called pre presets. Precepts, yes, lots of them. Uh, there's a bunch of them that come built into, uh, in the Lightroom, I mean, yeah. all of these, you know. Let's go and look at this infrared. I kind of like nice guys in infrared. <clears throat> so back to this. So okay. we got this brush, okay. Down here, we have an auto mask. Uh, I'm going to turn that off. I'll come back to it in a minute. You have feather, which is the same. Remember, in Photoshop, we're talking at the brush. Hardness, right? This feathering is the same thing. Hardness or softness. The bigger the feather, the softer the brush. No feather, very hard edge, okay? And then the flow is the same as the uh, over there. You don't really have a, in essence, a, an opacity, but the flow is the same deal. If, you, if your flow is 100%, anywhere you touch on this image, it's going to change. So if we just take exposure down. That's what it does if you click on it, right? Uh, <clears throat> so we're going to leave our, we're going to take our feather up and we're going to take our flow down because we don't want to dramatically change this immediately. We want to be able to kind of feather and softly try to take these tones down. The auto mask, what that does, and this is actually not a bad spot for it, this dark edge right here. If you're just painting without this on, and now what we're going to do is is the opposite of what we need, but let's say we're, we're increasing the exposure. And I'm going to, for exaggeration purposes, put this up. It's painting all this area, right? If you had the, and by the way, control Z takes you back a step. If you have the auto mask on, as long as you don't get that center crosshair or really anything beyond the edge of the feathering over that edge, it will automatically mask that off for you and won't paint anything under, uh, around it. So it is a way of masking, okay? There you go. It's like you're painting something, right? And it does it for you. Okay, so <clears throat> we'll leave that on. We're going to take and I would start in this situation, I would start with two things. I would start by bringing highlights down. I would also start by bringing the saturation down. Yeah. And might take this right here and move it down. This is white balance. Okay. All right, so I'm just moving it to the blue a little bit. Um, and then we just kind of say, all right, what does this do to us? Now, to me, that's still too, it's, it's, it's a hammer instead of being a light paintbrush. It's a little too strong because ultimately your edge is probably going to look a little sharper and a little more defined than you want it to be. But we're already painting, so we're just going to go ahead and paint this across here. Whoop, I got down low. But. All right, so we've got rid of a bunch of the yellow. We've still got some over there. You can go back and say, you know what, ah, that was too much. I'm going to go this direction. So once you paint it on there, you can make adjustments to these sliders and fine-tune things the way that you want them. And it knows where you already painted. It knows where you've already painted. You can always hit the O key. Well, I'm going to have to do... Let's not turn it on. 
Or maybe I need to turn it on. Oh, that's something I got to remember too. I, it frustrated me one day. I was, I was like, I like this image. I'm going to rate it a three. And I'm pushing a three and it's not reading it. And it's because as long as you have a brush or modifier open, it doesn't do anything else. Um, yeah, so uh, your keyboard doesn't work that way anyway. So you can always go back and select a brush that you've edited. So now it's green, white, red. So any of those areas that have been painted, if you decide, you know what, I've, I've impacted an area I don't want, you hold down the Alt key, notice it changes from a plus to a minus, and then you paint in, in these areas and it will erase it. Usually, then you can go back to the flow and just say, all right, change the flow up and you can kind of get rid of these areas that, you know what, I didn't want that to, to impact there anyway. 